Um, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, panel that will be dedicated to the uh, uh, theme of investing in France to build tomorrow, uh, tomorrow's value chains. My name is Raffaella Silvetti. I am head of inward investment at uh, Business France uh, Middle East. Um, um, in a nutshell, our job as the minister has explained is to facilitate and help foreign investment projects uh, in France in a very concrete uh, way. And in fact, I'm uh, already working um, on some projects with, uh, with some of you uh, in, in, in the room. Um, and I'm very pleased to be uh, joined in, at this round table by very, some very esteemed guests um, from uh, some world-renowned groups, firms, that um, facilitate, uh, help and support uh, foreign investors uh, in their investments worldwide in uh, issues such as uh, uh, strategy, tax, uh, legal, banking, uh, etc., as well as by some uh, leading companies that have already invested in France, um, and, and, and that will uh, provide us their um, feedback uh, on their experience. So again, we are really looking forward to your um, insights, advice, and, uh, and, uh, and feedback of, uh, uh, on your experience. As the minister, minister said, this is really a good timing to be talking about attractiveness in France. We are uh, experiencing a very um, positive trend, a very positive uh, momentum uh, in France in terms of attractiveness. Last month was in, particularly, in particular a very dense month in terms of events and uh, news about France's attractiveness. Uh, the minister uh, mentioned them. Let me uh, remind, because uh, we really want you to uh, finish the day, uh, go out of this, uh, um, leave this uh, uh, conference uh, with uh, um, this in mind. Uh, last uh, month, France was once again um, reconfirmed as the first destination in Europe for uh, uh, attracting foreign direct investment uh, overall and reconfirmed also its position in attracting, the first position in attracting investments in R&D and in uh, manufacturing. We will talk about this in greater detail, Mark. Uh, Business France uh, recorded the best results ever in, uh, in uh, attracting foreign direct investment in France. Again, last year in our annual report, uh, we uh, identified 1,700 1, investment projects uh, that created uh, nearly 60,000 jobs. In average, that means that every week we recorded 34 investment decisions, uh, and, and we facilitated many of those investment decisions. And then again, at the Choose France Summit, held around President Macron in Versailles a few weeks ago. Um, uh, all records uh, were um, uh, surpassed with over 200 uh, CEOs of world-renowned companies that participated to this meeting with over 16 billion euros of projects announced at, at, uh, at um, the summit. And, um, uh, as mentioned, also the participation of uh, uh, different CEOs of uh, sovereign um, of um, uh, GCC countries. What is interesting in all that is that besides these amazing uh, numbers that we are registering, um, if you if we look at the sectors where these projects are uh, increasingly uh, taking place in France uh, that are. Um, Happening in France, uh, for example, at Choose France, half of the projects were related to uh, ecological transitions and uh, as well as other uh, sectors such as uh, um, agri-tech, healthcare, um, tech and innovation. And looking at these sectors, clearly, these are the sectors where we both, uh, France and the GCC countries, uh, have our visions. So these are the sectors where we have shared ambitions, and these are the sectors that are um, where there is really um, an area of uh, cooperation, partnership, and uh, cross-investment, uh, really in a perspective, as mentioned by the minister, as, as underlined by the minister, of collaboration between the, the two parts to build tomorrow's value chains. Um, so this is, already, um, uh, this is already happening for uh, GCC countries. Uh, GCC countries have uh, long been uh, investors in, in France, um, especially in very traditional 
uh, sectors such as real estate, uh, hospitality. But today we are seeing a major trend towards uh, more interest in investing in uh, um, sectors of the future, in, uh, in tech, and in innovation. Just let me give you, allow me to give you a, um, a few examples. Uh, last year's largest investment announced at, um, at, Choose France, at the Choose France event was uh, that of uh, Mubadala's US subsidiary Global Foundries that announced a, a production site for uh, um, micro, um, for semiconductors, a site, uh, an, an investment of 5.7 billion and a site that will employ 1,000 people. A uh, few months ago, uh, the Qatar Investment Authority led uh, an investment round of 250 million to finance a uh, um, biotech, French biotech company, InnovaFeed, who is a leader in uh, alternative protein, and uh, going to some uh, 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 private company. In the last month, the uh, Saudi uh, group uh, Binda Wood invested in a French digital marketing company, Icon. So these are examples, public companies, uh, private companies. Um, to, to give this uh, um, message that France is not only uh, interesting for investment in traditional, uh, in traditional sectors, but really the new sectors, the sectors of uh, tomorrow are the ones where things are, are increasingly being uh, done. So without further wait, uh, Mark, we've been talking a lot about this uh, EY attractiveness survey. Um, it's really a reference survey for, uh, for investors. Can you tell us a little bit more about the insight, some, give us some insight and tell us more about the trends? Yes, my pleasure. Good morning, everyone. And, and first, thank you. Thank you, Axel. Thank you, Apeda, for your kind invitation. Um, you, the minister was kind enough to, to uh, remind everyone that uh, you know, the results of the very recently published EY attractiveness survey, which ranks European countries um, looks at a competition, very fierce competition to attract more investment, to retain investment, to help companies transform in this particular time um, of our economy. Um, and and it's, it's a reality, it's a fact. Independently uh, reported by EY, you can imagine uh, that France is back. Uh, back from years, probably a couple decades, when um, France was more seen for uh, high cost, high complexity, probably a lot of cliches and probably a lot of realities, uh, let's face it. And uh, it didn't change suddenly, but over the years, probably around 2015, 2016, and, and accelerated with the election of, of uh, President Macron, who put uh, Choose France uh, at the top of its agenda, France changed. And the results started coming very early. Why? Why? Uh, first reason is probably because uh, for businesses, for you, for us, for our clients, uh, all over the world, pretty much in every sector, uh, the price has to be right. And the business plan has to be predictable. Uh, so the first task was to get uh, to take care of the price and, and namely uh, reduce the tax pressure on businesses across industries again. And that was probably the first major iconic decision, commitment made, uh, to reduce the corporate income tax uh, from 30 3.3%, too, too high to 25% in the span of five years. And I, I must say that at the time uh, when we uh, polled companies, clients, when we polled ourselves at EY, uh, we said, wait and see. Because we'd seen this coming uh, for a while, uh, announcements and, and kind of a reversibility. Uh, frankly, it happens everywhere. But, but France was probably uh, seen as, as a country that uh, would change uh, over the years. It didn't change a tad in the five years when uh, this major commitment, lowering the corporate income tax. Again, I'm, I'm insisting on that because it's iconic, it's uh, spectacular. Uh, the government had every reason to slow down the process and the pace uh, during COVID, uh, when debt was created to support uh, our economy. Uh, it didn't change, and it even added to that. In a few uh, areas, research tax credits was reinforced, maintained and reinforced. Uh, 
tax for manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the first area, and I'll insist on two things. One, the commitments are important. There was also the commitment to uh, make our labor markets more flexible. Uh, very early on, so the first six months of the Macron presidency was, were very visible and very decisive, I think, we think, uh, in terms of making France more competitive and therefore more attractive to inward investment. Um, and what struck us is uh, certainly the level of the commitment, because it cost money. I mean, it was a brave decision to do it in a time where public, de public deficit looked after by the EU, public debt um, at a time with interest rates were affordable, not so much now. Um, it was a brave decision. And again, I want to insist that the consistency, the predictability, the fact that uh, despite everything that happened in our world and in France in the past six years, they didn't change the commitment. And to us, that's probably more important than the level of the commitment. I think you understand the message. Um, there was also a number of uh, you know, uh, good decisions. Again, the fact that business France, the business of France, for you, for French companies, small, large, in, again, every sector, with a focus on innovation and manufacturing, uh, frankly, those are two areas that probably are at the heart of, one, the future of France, innovation in every respect, life sciences, energy, uh, technology intensive, now AI, et cetera, et cetera, and manufacturing, because manufacturing at the early, uh, in the early years of this new era, uh, manufacturing was uh, at the low point of its uh, history. And, and, and you can't be an export country, a global economy, without a strong manufacturing base. So the plan to uh, reinforce manufacturing uh, is, is also a focus, and it, it paid off. Uh, not only did France become the number one country in terms of projects announced, it also was the number one country for manufacturing projects and for innovation projects, R&D projects. Um, I'll insist on a couple of other things and before I see what we think about the, the future and, and maybe the, the road ahead. And there are some bumps in the, road, on the, in the road ahead. I want to be honest, and you asked me, Rafaela, to be as direct and honest as possible. Um, Frankly, in Europe, 500 million consumers, uh, there is competition first between the big three. I'm used to a competition among the big four, uh, but the competition among the big three, Germany, the UK, and France, uh, is extremely brutal. It's friendly, because we're friends, and we're in Europe, despite Brexit. But Brexit, uh, as a matter of fact, was probably also a way for France to, uh, it, it, there is no, uh, joy in seeing uh, a major economy in Europe, uh, a friend in the diplomatic, cultural, every sense of the way, not, not so much on the football pitch, but, but everywhere else, uh, see uh, an economy so strong, so important for, for Europe uh, to be hit. And, and I oversee uh, our economic competitiveness, attractiveness teams across Europe. So I'm not French today. I'm European. And, but Brexit directly hit the performance, the extraordinary performance of the UK to attract inward investment, headquarters, financial services, and, and probably a lot of your companies. Uh, but it did help France. What helped France also was the fact that Germany, so successful as the number one exporter of Europe, um, so successful in most supply chains, automotive, energy, industrial equipment, consumer goods, electronics, um, is also one of the countries where employment, recruitment is the hardest. 3.1% unemployment is a difficulty for new entrants. The 7.1% that France is still experiencing, that's, that's, not, a, that's not a positive. Uh, we need to work to provide jobs. But that is a, an advantage, a competitive advantage. And the fact that you've seen so many massive investments in northern France and other regions is also due to the fact that employment is easier in France than it is in some other countries, first and foremost Germany, uh, where recruitment and the entry in new supply chains. Another point, low carbon economy. 94% of the French energy to industry is low carbon if you want it, 94%. Thanks to the decision to maintain a nuclear base and 
recently to reinvest and reshape and restart some nuclear plants, uh, no hesitation. And I think it's not consensual, but it's the sound decision. I don't think you hear a lot at the uh, parliament uh, yesterday. I don't think you would hear a lot even uh, from the Green parties about uh, killing the nuclear, uh, uh, the nuclear energy in France because it is actually our number one competitive advantage for industry. That's what our survey says, and I certainly believe what our survey says. I'll end with a couple of other notes. Um, is everything rosy for the future? Uh, certainly not. First, globally, in Europe, uh, there needs to be a strong Europe to have a strong France. That's my number one message. Uh, there needs to be consistency in the efforts to maintain and even reinforce uh, the competitiveness reforms. Um, and, and, and that means probably a lot more braver decisions ahead to reduce taxes across the board. Uh, France is still a country where you have, and my friend and esteemed colleague Roland will probably address that, you have to work and optimize, and there are ways to do it um, transparently um, to optimize your tax pressure and your tax position. Uh, but certainly it's, it's a major areas for improvement. Um, there, is, there are areas for improvement in the complexity of France. I'd say very frankly, I'm French, so I've been living for 50 plus years in this complexity, and really, I love it um, for my job, but also <coughs> because I think it's part of the French DNA uh, and mystery and charm maybe, but we're not the only charming country, and sometimes complexity kills the charm. Um, but there has to be less bureaucracy and, and probably more fluidity and rapidity in the way decisions are made. It's very important now to be very rapid, probably more than ever to be rapid in setting up operations to making uh, licensing, building permits, environmental permits. And there was a big commitment a month ago at the Elysee Palace where we, uh, some of us, uh, some of you were there, um, uh, listened and heard the president say, among another, uh, another round of commitments to uh, make France's industry greener, also to make France's uh, speed uh, much, much bigger with a nine-month, you understand what the nine-month symbol means, nine-month uh, commitment to deliver all public permits. Um, that's a major commitment. Today it's probably between three and four years uh, for most very complex industrial and innovative uh, setting up. I want to finish this because I want to leave, of course, room for the panel, but you asked me to lay the ground and I want to wanted to give you a, a, a very direct opinion. There's probably also too much debt and public finance, but I think if, if we're consistent, and I, that's my main message, I think you heard me right, the consistency, uh, stay in the course. Uh, I'm a sailor, so I like to know what the course is, and sometimes you have to navigate, but you know where you're getting. You change the sails, but you, uh, you are comfortable with your crew. You make everybody else comfortable, and then you get there. I think that's what France will be there, so unequivocally, very directly, very frankly, very independently, I'd say France, for us, for EY, in Europe, is a go. Rather, it's a come, come to France, and that was my message today. Perfect, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Many um, uptakes from, uh, from your uh, speech, um, um, the, sovereign, the, the position in R&D, uh, as we were uh, mentioning before you started the speech, for example, uh, uh, there is um, a large group that was here yesterday. I think they, they, they're not joining us today, but Aramco uh, in the region that is an R&D center in, uh, in, in Paris for uh, um, uh, since uh, many years in, 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 uh, in partnership with a, with a research center. So it's, it's something that is already... Uh, uh, there are already GCC countries that, are, uh, that know these advantages in, in doing R&D in France. Uh, you mentioned again a low carbon economy. Um, you mentioned uh, the the need also to speed uh, the reforms and continue with the the reforms, uh, which is uh, exactly what the government is uh, is, is doing to um, to uh, continue its uh, its uh, uh, movement towards uh, making France uh, even more more uh, competitive. Um, Maybe I would like to give the floor now to um, uh, First Abu Dhabi Bank, so Christophe Borland. Yes. You are manager of France of First Abu Dhabi Bank, so I would like to 
uh, your group is uh, not only uh, a leading financial institution in this GCC, but you are present in France, uh, so you know very well both sides. I would like to have your uh, view on the economic landscape in France and investment climate and how this um, uh, uh, align with the, the, the interests and, uh, and uh, uh, projects of uh, uh, companies in the GCC. Sure, thank you, uh, Rafaela. Well, I think uh, the minister and Mark uh, have already said a lot about the attractiveness and the increased attractiveness of France uh, nowadays. Um, I would just uh, highlight a few points, but I think uh, one very important thing is the stability of the uh, legal tax and uh, uh, you know, business environment. This is something where we've had over the last uh, 30 years, and I will not uh, make any politi political statement, especially in Bercy, of course, but we've known uh, many uh, turnarounds. And the good point uh, since uh, the arrival of President Macron is definitely a clear path for simplification, for innovation, as Mark said also, and also creating the means for foreign investors like ours uh, to know where basically we are stepping in. Uh, this was not the case before. We have to be honest, you know, we decided to be honest today, I understand. Uh, so this is a, a big challenge compared to the past. And for a bank like ours, which is, as you said, one of the leading uh, institutions in the region, it's very important. We have significant investment plans. We want to be exactly in between, you know, the economies of the region and France and European Union, of course. Because uh, for your information, Paris is the only uh, presence uh, of uh, the bank in the European Union. Uh, by the way, we discussed over the last uh, two years, uh, maybe expanding also our activities in Europe. We were considering maybe opening a subsidiary in Germany. Why not in Dublin, in Ireland? And after due consideration, we decided to stick with our current French uh, operation. One of the reasons, of course, was exactly what I was referring to. The stability, the vision, uh, you know, we call our, our, our today's uh, a conference Vision Golf, but I think Vision France is clearer for most foreign investors nowadays. And for a bank like ours, which is really uh, supporting the investors from the Gulf region in France, refinancing their investments in France. And on the other hand, which is very important, of course, supporting the large multinationals from France the, towards our key markets in the region. Of course, UAE, yeah, that's obvious, but also KSA and Egypt. You know, these are the three domestic markets, as we call them, uh, for, uh, you know, perspective of First Abu Dhabi Bank. And to be able to know that the companies we work for are in the region for the long term, are ready to invest, are, are ready to partner with us, you know. The big word for us is partnering. And I think really that uh, what we've experienced over the last uh, five years plus is very positive. So I'm quite confident about the coming days. I would say. Thank you very much. So you would definitely be there to help both foreign investors coming to France or, uh, that are in, in this room, as well as French companies that are interested in doing business in, uh, in uh, GCC uh, uh, countries. We were talking before uh, the start, uh, we were talking a, a lot during these days about everything green. We were talking about green financing. You are... This is absolutely key. Obviously, uh, you know, the, the energy transformation is the key word, key buzzword, and I've seen there are also round tables on the topic uh, during those two days. Uh, for us, it's absolutely key. Uh, First Abu Dhabi Bank is the only bank in the region belonging to the Net Zero Banking Alliance, which is a key commitment. You know, when you have your, in your name, in your company name, when you have Abu Dhabi, you wouldn't automatically think about green finance and green financing, basically. But of course, uh, it, it goes both ways. We cannot forget about oil and gas in the coming 20 years. This is not uh, sustainable. This is not reasonable to think about this. But what we can do is use the profits of this industry to go for greener energy. 
And uh, I have many examples of this with our clients. You know, I, I would only mention one, EDF, where we had uh, done a fantastic uh, plan of, of a solar plant in the UAE and, and in other countries also. And this is something where uh, you know, our commitment to green finance is very important in a, in a moment where you know, this necessity in terms of uh, climate change, et cetera, et cetera, makes also new business opportunities. And we know that the French innovation is extraordinary in the topic. You, you mentioned also the KSA Research Center, for instance, Aramco. Uh, this is a good example. And uh, I'm sure that in the coming uh, years, you know, we will have many of those, both over here and also in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your perspective. I would, would like now to go to a real case study. I would like to, to invite um, uh, the group. Sorry. Um, you, uh, you are a leading group, uh, luxury group in the Middle East. Uh, you are already present in France. Uh, with different investments. I would like to, to talk a little bit uh, about your presence in France with uh, um, uh, luxury uh, uh, group Christophe. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the story, how it started, um, and the reasons behind this decision to, to set up in France? Thank you, Rafaela, and thank you for this um, opportunity to, to shed light on a real case study of a group headquartered in a uh, in, uh, in the Middle East, in Dubai particularly, investing in, um, in France. And maybe let me uh, remind people about what Chaloup Group is, because I'm not sure people, everyone understands understand what it is about in, in, the, in the room. And sorry for those who attended the retail uh, panel yesterday who may have heard about, about Chaloup already. So Chaloup is, uh, is the leader of luxury retail in the Middle East, uh, present in uh, uh, all the countries in the, in the GCC with 700 stores, 15,000 employees, and representing or operating 300 brands, so luxury brands, mostly in the field of fashion, beauty, and art de vivre. Uh, the group, as, and I think it, it's fair to say, but it was much before I, I joined it, really shaped the luxury market in the Middle East, and the Shalom family really were pioneers who we bought the first luxury uh, in, industry and brands in a region that knew very little at that time about luxury. Um, and to tell you the truth, when uh, Axel asked me um, to, to participate to this panel, I was a bit hesitant. Because, first of all, uh, we don't necessarily see ourselves as a fully-fledged Middle Eastern group. We see ourselves as a bridge between West and East. Uh, and a bridge goes both ways. So uh, it's one thing that I also wanted to, uh, to say. And the other reason is that our investment in Christophe may not be uh, an investment by the book. It's not an investment that is driven by ROI, by financial profit. It's much more of a, an emotional, uh, and after all, luxury is about emotions. So it's, it's quite logical. It's an emotional investment. And why have we invested in, in Christophe? Uh, Christophe is the first, is the very first brand that the Shalou, group, Shalou family operated back in Damascus in 1955. So the first store opened by the family was a, 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 a Christophe boutique. And well, you know that Silversmith has been facing headwinds, struggled a bit with the change in the consumer behaviors. Uh, so the brand has known some difficulties over time. And the Shalou family invested to support the group over, over the years. And in 2016, the group itself decided to finally completely acquire Christophe and to integrate it in the group. So it's now completely part of, of, of the Shalou family, extended family. Um, so what are we looking for uh, in this investment? I, I would say three things. The first thing is uh, building equity. As, as a retailer, we are an intermediate, we are a, a, a middleman between brands and consumer. And we aim at being a fully-fledged luxury player. And I think Christophe uh, gives us this very, very strong brand equity. It's a brand created in 1830 by Charles Christophe, a brand that has a an amazing, outstanding um, savoir-faire, history, uh, heritage, uh, 
the brand has equipped uh, uh, L'Orient Express, uh, uh, the Concorde, uh, the Normandy, uh, the Opera de Paris. So an amazing history, uh, so official supplier to uh, the, the French head of state during the Monarchy de Juillet and, and the Second Empire. So uh, an amazing equity to, to tap into, which is absolutely fascinating. The uh, second reason is that it solidifies uh, our positioning in the Middle East as a uh, leader in the art de vivre category. So we also operate other brands, like a French brand like Bernardo, like Baccarat, like Lalique, and so on, and also brands, art de vivre brands that are not necessarily French. And we have our own concept called uh, Tanagra. So this investment in Christophe help us solidify our, our positioning in, in, in this segment. And the last uh, reason behind this investment is uh, that it's, it's, a, it's a way to discover uh, 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 the upstream part of luxury, which is all about craftsmanship, production. We have a, Christophe has a factory in Normandy, Yenville, with now more, more than 200 um, employees. So for us, it's a, it's a complete discovery. We are really discovering the upstream supply chain, how to make a factory work, how to reinvest into a factory that has been a bit uh, maybe left behind over, over the years. So we are reinvesting massively in the capacity, in, in the uh, uh, devices of, of this factory to be able to reinsource a part of the production that over time were outsourced outside of France and also to obviously uh, to, to, to hire more people and also to uh, foster the, uh, the training of the people because there is an amazing savoir-faire that has been a bit forgotten over the years that really needs to be uh, protected, developed, uh, passed on to the new generation and, and so we are working very strongly on uh, mentorship, mentoring to make sure that we can pass on these, the, all these abilities and skills to, to, to new people. Thank you very much. So you are present in France, you are even uh, reshoring uh, pro production in, in, uh, in France. Uh, very briefly, because uh, time is passing, um, we were discussing about, um, uh, with you about the kind of support, for example, that you have um, found at the local level, at the national level, on, uh, on, uh, for your uh, uh, production uh, activity here in France. Very briefly, can you tell us something about this? Yeah, three, three things I would like to stress on. The first one is um, uh, the talents. We have found in France an amazing amount of talent, of talented people, especially in the field of craftsmanship. Um, ecosystem, strong ecosystem, um, especially in Normandy, you have brands like Guy de Graine, Moviel, uh, Moviel 1830, very strong art de vivre, art de la table brands. And I think this ecosystem in really define as well uh, local and industrial ecosystem defines one, in my opinion, of the uh, key advantage of France. Uh, because it creates synergies, ability to, to work together on, 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 on savoir-faire and how to maintain savoir-faire. And the third support that we got was more coming from the public authorities. Uh, obviously, during COVID, the, the, like many other companies, Christophe has suffered a lot. And uh, we were lucky enough to receive a support for, for, from the state through a, a state-guaranteed loan uh, from the Région Normandy as well. And today we are working uh, with, uh, with the CCI uh, de Rouen, for instance, to, uh, to work on a school for luxury and, to, and to, to work on talent and training. So quite a substantial uh, key success factor that we have found in, in, in France uh, through this investment. That's very interesting. Talent, ecosystem, support. I think the, uh, it's a good mix uh, for... Uh, for uh, any companies uh, operating uh, anywhere. So thank you very much. I would now like to turn to um, uh, Roland Montfort of uh, um, a law firm, uh, Brian Cave, Lidon Paisner. Um, you have a long history in uh, advising uh, GCC investors and other international clients in investing in, in France and elsewhere. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, reforms in, uh, in uh, France, the, the pro-business agenda, pro agenda of the French government. Uh, can you give us, as a lawyer, your perspective on the legal environment in France and how it has evolved and how it favors uh, investors? Hello, everyone. So please, please to do that, uh, Rafaela. So uh, first, uh, I'm very pleased to be here today with you and uh, very honored that Business France asked me to take part to this panel with uh, highly regarded professionals and experts. So thanks very much. 
Um, yes, I, I do have 30 years of experience in advising uh, uh, foreign uh, clients uh, investing in France, whether from the US, Asia, Middle East, of course. And, um, you know, usually lawyers are the bad guys, I mean, uh, associated with problems and uh, difficulties. Um, and I cannot tell you that the, uh, the bankers maybe too. <laughs> I will not tell you that the uh, French legal system is an easy system, but how could it be easy? Uh, legal issues are complex by nature. And uh, also, France is not totally free. France is part of the EU. France is part of the EOCD. So on the tax front, for example, double tax treaty, this is OECD driven, so France cannot do whatever it wants. Same for, uh, for, same for EU regulation that impose on France certain limits, etc. So. Um, we should keep that in mind. But what I can tell you is that um, the French legal system is absolutely doable. Um, it should not be seen as a break, as a hurdle, or as a negative factor in your decision to invest in France. You will invest in France because of economic reasons, profitability, strategic, tactical, etc. reasons, and legal things are not here to be a stopper. They are, and we are here professionals to help you out to navigate, but it's perfectly doable to navigate the French legal system. And uh, of course, every investment project is different. If you have a buyout or takeover M&A transaction of a French company, if you invest in a greenfield project, if you are in the renewable energy, or if you want to build an electric battery factory, this is totally different from software development or consumer and retail distributorship investment. So you need experts, of course, to help and, the, and to look at the regulation for each of these different, uh, different investments. And I can also tell you that I have probably worked uh, across maybe more than 50 or 60 different legal systems in my career. Um, and uh, uh, if we look at the comparison between France and the other legal system, France can easily meet the challenge. There are, of course, in certain countries, some rigidity there and there, and in France there and there, but overall, the French legal system <coughs> is very flexible and doable. So maybe we can give quickly some general uh, uh, examples of that. Uh, I think that, first of all, uh, France, France legal system is in advance on, on, uh, compared to peers uh, or competitors in different areas. An example, a quick example, ESG, sustainability. We have ESG regulations since a few years, and we are well in advance of other countries, even in the EU, on ESG. We can take the SAS corporate format, Société par Action Simplifiée, which we have since more than 25 years. This is a very flexible corporate format for joint ventures, for any kind of investment, and we have that again for 20 years. I can take also the fact that investment into France are free since more than 30 years. It's easy to invest. There is no much regulatory barriers in an investment into France. Of course, you have sensitive sectors like defense, like uh, produce, production of uh, drugs, which would uh, require some clearance from uh, uh, Bercy, uh, the Ministry uh, of Economy. But overall, the system is very free, and uh, the invest, uh, investment in France are protected. So you are a foreign investor, you can be sure that your ownership on the French assets, uh, whether uh, you know, real estate assets, manufacturing plants, uh, shares of a French company, this is protected, this is your ownership. Nobody will take it from you. And the repatriation of profits back to your country is easy. There is a free movement of transfer of dividends uh, you know, to your country. So uh, we have multiple examples of that. Maybe a last one, which is, um, uh, which is very comfortable is, is that the French legal system is reliant. It, it allows companies to be reliant in case of crisis. We faced that during COVID. What did the government do? It, it, they created these guaranteed loans to help the business to get through the crisis. And I can add to that that we have, um, at the French courts, we have prevention mechanism uh, in case a company is a little bit downsizing and uh, at the limit of lack of profitability and before getting insolvent, we have tools to rescue the company. And we have professional judges there to avoid 
that a, that a company would go bankrupt. And we can, so I think overall we, we should, you know, take a distance from the cliché and the pictures that we can have in mind that we see on TV, you know, social unrest, French are doing strikes, uh, the, the labor law is very rigid, the tax law, the tax are very high. I think that is not true. Again, if I take a few examples, the, the French labor law has been changed, uh, including very recently, uh, including when you want to terminate employees, or when you have to deal with the, uh, uh, with, you know, we have in France what we call works council, so it's a collective body which represents employees of a company. I mean, this, you may have to inform and consult this works council, but they have no veto right. So you can still do whatever you want, but you have to inform and consult them. So it's a question of timing, of procedure, but it's not a veto, it's not an obstacle. And I could quickly go to the tax front. Um, as you may know, you, in case of distribution of dividend, you have a flat tax of 12.5%. We have a very uh, flexible and smooth double tax treaty with the Gulf countries, uh, which is a real asset. As you may know, we have the uh, Crédit Impôt Recherche, the CIR. We have other incentives for innovative companies. We have a bunch of state aid, whether at central, regional, local levels. So again, we have multiple you know, tools and examples of the fact that the French legal system is here to help and not an obstacle for your investment into France. That was a very clear and complete um, uh, answer. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Roland, um, maybe I would like to um, uh, see the perspective of a company. Uh, uh, I will uh, give the word to uh, our um, um, ICON representative, CEO Olivier. Um, uh, ICON is a, a leading digital uh, marketing agency. Since last year, it became uh, part of uh, uh, Binda Wood Group. Um, you are present in many countries. You operate in many countries. Um, can you uh, uh, maybe elaborate a bit on what uh, has just been said on, on your experience as a company operating in different, uh, in different jurisdictions and how does that compare? Sure. Um, so Icon is a company that I started 15 years ago, right after school. I was 23, I had no network, no capital, diplomas, but that's it. What I found in France is uh, an incubator, venture capital, business angel, free lawyers, pro bono. So from me being 23 to achieving the first milestone of my company, I received approximately 2 million euros of uh, free VC funding and free lawyers and support from the French government with Crédit Impôt Recherche and many innovation. And I'm very proud that uh, that has been possible uh, uh, in, in France. Quite quickly, I realized that we have such an amazing savoir-faire in France, especially in my field of advertising. We have publicists, we have amazing schools. Unfortunately, the economic growth in France is single digit. So I felt the need to expand my company to other countries, and today Icon is present in a grass 15 countries. We have teams in China, in India, in the Middle East, all across Europe, and in the US. The French are the best, no doubt. I mean, I have 200 employees, 40 of them are French. They are the best on multiple criteria. Um, bon, diplomas, school, these are the elite. Two, in my business, they have the highest margin. So my company runs at 30% margin, 45 in France, 23 in Italy, 19 in Germany. So we are able to capture a more important um, part of the, of the value. The legal, social, bureaucratic system is the best. Bon, I've run 19 companies in 15 countries as a, voilà, I was just a kid. Huh? I had no problems. Even when the VAT authority came, when the fiscal authority came, everyone was honestly nice, professional, cool, laid back. I have never had any stress, nightmares in my life, except with my divorce. But as an entrepreneur, it was always chill and laid back. Um, so I love France. It's a wonderful country, and I would never see myself exiting 
for lower staff, lower tax. Tax are quite very limited. You know, I, 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 I recently sold a piece of my company to uh, the Bin Daoud uh, group. I realized that on my profit, on my uh, earnings, I paid 2.5% tax. Fully legit. I created a, a société civile. Uh, I own my company through an intermediary company. All of that is fully well, uh, good news. So why did we end up having a, a Saudi family uh, as an investor? So first, we had TF1, a TV company, as an investor until uh, 2018. But we had so much passion for growth uh, that we wanted to expand globally. And what we found in the Middle East is passion for growth, passion for entrepreneurs, passion for multiculturalism. So when I was looking for new investors, I went to New York, I went to London, I went to Shanghai, and by chance, I passed by RIAI during the FII summit, and by chance, I met uh, Mr. Ahmad bin Daoud, which I had no clue who he was. And Ahmad asked me, uh, how much does it cost? And I thought that Ahmad was asking me, what's the price of doing a campaign on social media? So I said, uh, Ahmad, uh, if you want to make a campaign, it is uh, 200K dollar. And then he said, no, how much for the company? <laughs> and that was, um, so then we had a deal. Uh, and what I found extremely impressive is um, working with a family. I love family. Uh, I truly believe in, in, the, in that when the family has strong values that aggregate the entire ecosystem. And uh, when I was seeking for investment, I saw in London, in Shanghai, what I felt were more Ponzi scheme than family. You don't really know where the money is coming from. You don't really know why you pay those management fees to venture capital. You don't really know who are the ultimate beneficiary of these investments. In Saudi Arabia, I met a real family. They invited me to their place, and they, come, they came to my office. Ahmad bin Daoud, traveling himself from Jeddah to Paris to meet my team, blew my mind. It was not the best offer. People think that because in the Middle East there are money, we'll make more money. No, that's not the case, right? But we found an ecosystem of very strong value, and today, Icon is a proud European company taking advantage of the brains, the growth, the luxury market, the advertising ecosystem, and we, we love it. But we're also proud to have a Saudi family on our back. One of the multiple um, advantage of this is uh, Sharia uh, finance. No interest. How amazing is it? So we are currently acquiring our competitors. We are doing what we call a, an, an, an uh, a build up, and we can acquire these companies benefiting from the cash of our company, parent company, without having to pay in this interest. I'll stop my, uh, now this my was... love declaration <laughs> to uh, the Middle East. <laughs> this was uh, very interesting, really um, uh, passionate for, uh, for everybody. I think. We are uh, uh, running uh, um, out of our time. We've been uh, in, in perfect time, in fact. Um, I think the insights uh, uh, that have been shared here are really um, very, very interesting from, for everybody. I think now everybody is, uh, is quite motivated to, to consider uh, in, in a greater detail uh, the, the, the possibility. You, you, you want to say a last? Maybe to insist on something that I experienced since years and years, it's the total dedication of the French uh, uh, agents on the French party. Uh, what I mean is that I've always been uh, on the other side, you know, with the investors and across the table at the French party and the French ministry and the French uh, agencies. And I've always found systematically people totally dedicated, expert in what they do, uh, trying to accelerate, trying to support, uh, so, of course, you would need to negotiate and the interest maybe in this negotiation sometimes a little bit different. But same strategy, same objective, being there to serve, to facilitate investment. So, these guys are partners, there to help. And I have seen that systematically since 30 years, whether at central level, the Bercy here, regional level with the prefet, local level with the municipality, maybe you have experienced the same. So, these guys are fantastic and here to help you. Thank you very much. We, we would, would uh, uh, like to continue for hours to, to, to listen to you. I think uh, that uh, um, our panelists are available for, uh, to, to keep discussing with you. I myself 
uh, will be more than happy to, to meet uh, each of you individually uh, uh, during our networking uh, time. So thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists and thank you for uh, listening to this, uh, to this uh, uh, panel, investment panel. Thank you so much.